Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Today I want to talk about the drama of the 20th century, especially uh, the trends of the drama in the first half of the century and how the face of drama uh, and the character of English drama had changed forever under different, uh, different directions and orientation exported from some other countries into England. So England um, is not at first a producer of dramas, um, except for some main major Irish dramatists such as Oscar Wilde and uh, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, they didn't have any figures in English drama uh, who can contribute something. Uh, so, so, and, and we shouldn't forget that both of them were Irish. Um, so in late 19th century, Engle English drama was uh, turned into a form of entertainment, like going to cinema, and the drama uh, was not uh, was not anymore a technical way of performing a play, an idea. So the people went there, watching it, they, they paid money, they spent some time just like going into a cinema or a, uh, or a movie theater. Uh, but uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, different incidents and different historical uh, trends um, helped uh, to, to help English drama to change character. One of these movements was the Abbey Theatre. Abbey Theatre was the name of this location you see in the picture and as, as the signs and hints are showing it is related to Irish drama and to the Irish nationalist movement uh, which was a significant uh, a movement for the Irish independence at the beginning of the 20th century. In the Abbey Theatre, the playwrights such as W.B.A. Singe, uh, Sean O'Keefe, under the uh, sponsorship of Lady Gregory. Lady Gregory was a rich lady and she was a nationalist and she was interested in reviving the roots of the Irish people. Uh, so so they, they produced dramas which provoked a sense of Irishness. It was about the roots, about uh, the forgotten conscience of the Irish people. Uh, in many of these dramas, uh, we see the revival uh, of the Irish myth about different characters, different um, Irish legends and sagas. And some of them are like like Sean O'Keefe's The Plough and the Stars um, engages uh, the whole play in one of the tenements in which uh, the, the people are living during the controversial week of the um, um, the um, Irish Easter, uh, in the Irish actually uh, kind of revolution in 1916. So the plays uh, are about Ireland, whether about the mythological version of Ireland, uh, mostly interested by a person like W. B. Yeats, or the socialist aspects of the of the representation of the country, like was uh, what was intended by Sean by Sean O'Casey. Um, by the way, uh, the, this uh, Abbey Theatre, or um, which was a part of what is called the Irish Revival or the Abbey Revival. Um, gave a new nationalistic sense and of course uh, uh, to English drama, of course it was um, a, a representation um, of of the protest of the Irish uh, people against uh, the rule of the British government. So it, it can be considered as a precursor of later post-colonial plays written in countries such as Nigeria and South Africa by people such as Wola Shoinka and Athel Fugard. Uh, another form of poetry uh, by T.S. Eliot was a revival of, a, of the traditional Attic tragedy. T.S. Eliot tried uh, to follow uh, the, in the, the ancient Greek dramatist such as Sophocles and he wrote a poetic drama. In no more maybe poetic dramas were written after the Romantics. Romantics, Byron Shelley wrote dramas in poetic form, uh, but um, it, it was rather uh, forgotten by the dramatist. T.S. Eliot revived it and um, his play made a considerable success uh, in reviving the ritual poetic drama. In, in this play, uh, The Murder in Cathedral, T.S. Eliot revives the notion of the chorus. These people you see in the picture, in the, in the right side of the picture, are the chorus. The chorus 
in a Greek tragedy and the Greek comedy generally uh, in those Greek uh, plays where the commentators on the stage, they sometimes contributed to the plot line of the story. So uh, T.S. Eliot tried to revive uh, this part of the genre alongside writing a, a, a play uh, where uh, the whole of it is in poetic form. Merely in Cathedral concerning its subject matter is about Thomas A. Beckett. Uh, Thomas A. Beckett uh, was the uh, martyr of the Canterbury. That's why Canterbury's Cathedral uh, was a place for pilgrimage because um, his blood was shed in there while he was praying to God by uh, by actually three knights, so who were uh, the supporters of the king at the time. So um, T.S. Eliot um, um, considers a historical incident um, and he's somehow reviving some medieval th themes and um, uh, alongside to it, um, he's adding up something from the Greek uh, drama and, and the Attic tragedy to his play. Uh, of course, some other poetic dramas were written at the time, uh, almost the contemporaries of Eliot in, in the United States were written in such plays, uh, but, but it, was, it was a short kind of fashion because, anyway, the capabilities of drama to be, to be written in modern times in a poetic form and uh, what the language can afford uh, and, of course, um, how the audience would react to it would be different um, or, or maybe um, it would be a short-term kind of uh, fashion uh, for for this reason uh, that uh, that many years ago, about a century ago, uh, Henrik Ibsen had claimed that the poetry is to write a poetic drama is to use the language of the gods, and he says now it's time for the people to have their voice in a drama, and um, it was altogether uh, forgotten to be to to be a writer of a poetic drama. So uh, T. S. Eliot was trying to revive something, but maybe. Uh, only a single play, Murdering Cathedral, uh, was a successful one um, concerning the ideas uh, of the reviewers and the audience. Another mode of uh, dramatic <clears throat> performance was expressionist drama. Uh, the uh, source of, <coughs> I'm sorry, and the origins, the source and the origins of expressionist drama was Germany. And of course, uh, the uh, dream plays of the and psychological focus of uh, the later plays written by the Swedish dramatist August Strindberg. And generally, let me tell you that uh, there are three main figures who had uh, who had given a new life uh, to modern drama. Uh, these figures are Henrik Ibsen, who was Norwegian, and he's called the father of modern drama. And then uh, reacting to Ibsen was uh, the Russian Anton Chekhov. And reacting to both of them, <clears throat> I'm sorry, was the Swedish August Strindberg. And later on, the German expressionist uh, took the uh, dream plays of August Strindberg and uh, they wrote plays which are called expressionist because they are dependent on the expression uh, of, of a feeling rather than um, just articulating or announcing it via language. So language is no more the medium of communication in these plays and uh, the, uh, we can say that the unit of language is uh, demoted from from the sentence to telegraphic uh, ex, uh, expression to word to a single word in these space. So language is not important, rather other means of expressions, and therefore the title expressionist um, are considered prominent by the dramatists and the directors. It means that what, what what do we mean by actually other means of expression? We mean music light um, um, or just putting a screen uh, over the stage or using images, pictures, mannequins and things like that. So, uh, or even sometimes mirrors. So instead of expressing everything via language, uh, mask, uh, color, um, light, uh, the screens and what appeared uh, on the screens took the place 
uh, of, of the linguistic performance. Uh, the American Eugene O'Neill, for example, believed that uh, in his article, the memoranda of mask, believed that uh, the, the people are too much into the performance via language, that uh, after the time of Shakespeare, we, we are just uh, accustomed to hear uh, bombastic, uh, language performances and the car and the actors do not care about the body language. So he thought that uh, the actors should wear a mask and play with other parts of their bodies. So color and things like that are now using to express the emotion or an idea, or sometimes the symbols are used. So everything is in there to take the place of language in the expressionist drama. If you're in search of an expressionist drama in English language, you can refer to uh, Long Day's Journey, The Long Day's Journey Tonight by Eugene O'Neill, or um, you can refer to Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. In Death of a Salesman, for example, whenever the character goes into his memories, uh, Willy Loman, I mean, the, the, color, the color of the light changes into, uh, into orange. So there is a marker in there. Or in uh, The Long Day's Journey Into Night by uh, Eugene O'Neill, whenever there is a fog or whenever we hear some sounds, some specific sounds, uh, we know that something is up in the place without mentioning it via language. And also, um, we can mention Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie as an example of expressionist drama. Remember the scene in which Laura and, uh, and John are dancing? And um, the, the light, because because the lamp um, or or the electricity has some problem, maybe they haven't paid for the electricity. Um, the, the the color of the room anyway changes into pink when they are dancing, and we can hear the music of uh, some waltz um, in a nearby place. Or when Amanda, the mother, remembers her memories uh, when she was a girl, uh, we see something uh, appearing on the screen. Uh, just put it put on the stage uh, by 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 the director. Or when Laura mentions blue roses, we see the image of the blue roses um, on that screen. So these are the modes of expressionist drama. Another unique way of a writing of drama uh, was uh, what Bertolt Brecht, the German dramatist, had called epic drama. Uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, was against uh, the tradition of drama, whether the Aristotelian tra tradition or the Ibsenian one. Uh, for Bertolt Brecht, what was important was to omit the notion of catharsis from, from the play. The notion of the catharsis was for the first time explained by Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, philosopher in his poetics, um, Aristotle explained that uh, it's kind of a relief from our feelings, especially the feeling of pity and fear. So when uh, it seemed that what by catharsis Aristotle means while watching a play, you identify with the character or the hero of the play. But uh, after the catharsis happens, after you see the ending, a, a sense of relief um, relief is, is experienced by the audience because they they uh, no, they feel uh, they feel that they are no more the character. The uh, the identification stops at that point when the play plays and uh, plays ended. So uh, they, they they came uh, out of the theater house relieved, uh, and this is what Bertolt Brecht is against it. And whenever uh, in twentieth century after Bertolt Brecht, you discuss different modes of uh, dramatic representation, you have to remember remember that how, uh, how the dramatist has uh, responded to the issue of catharsis. So uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, thought that uh, contrary to the idea of um, catharsis pro uh, promoted by Aristotle, you uh, you have to engage uh, the minds of the audience, not their emotions. So they, they shouldn't identify. They should always be reminded that this is only a play, that there should always be a distance between the, the audience and the characters of the play so that the logic, the, the faculty of logic of the audience would start thinking. And they can also criticize what is over the stage rather than identifying with it. So um, he 
called his uh, dramatic mode of uh, playwriting epic drama. By epic drama, he means, first of all, that this is an epic, not another tragedy or a comedy, so it doesn't have a catharsis in the Aristotelian sense of the term. And also, um, he... Uh, he was against uh, the idea that, uh, that that the play should have a linear plot. Aristotle has mentioned that a play should have a beginning, a middle, and an uh, and an end. But um, Bre uh, Brecht thought that an epic um, um, is is a kind of episodic performance or a kind of episodic um, uh, representation. So it doesn't have a it doesn't follow a linear plot. The plot can jump or leap sometimes and uh, besides that um, in, an epic starts in media stress not from the beginning so um, this is also pointed out by Bertolt Brecht and uh, in, in the time of Henrik Ibsen it was believed that the playwright should represent the illusion of reality on the stage and um, Bertolt Brecht was against it. Uh, he, um, Ibsen believed that the fourth, uh, the, the fourth, you know, the, the audience is just looking into the homes of the people while the fourth wall is broken, so that so they can see through. But uh, as if this is the real life uh, happening in there. But for Bertolt Brecht, it is not the real life, and the audience has no right to to feel and think that they are in there. Uh, in order to um, to avoid this. Uh, feeling or this uh, formation of the illusion of reality in the minds of the audience, he used the technique of alienation effect or the distancing effect, or what in German is called Verfremdung's effect. Uh, by this, he means that uh, you, you you should always, as a dramatist, you, you should always use techniques uh, which uh, foreground the tra theatrical aspects, that it is just a construct like, like this one. You see, this is taken from his The Good Woman of Setsuan or The Good Person of Setsuan. Uh, the, the play has translated twice into English with two different titles. By the way, uh, you see that the gods are here on the earth, but uh, but you see the machinery all over the stage so that you're reminded of the of the thing uh, thinghood of the place just a performance not a reality or the representation of illusion of reality and uh, many of the plays therefore by Bertolt Brecht are minimalistic over the stage so that the audience wouldn't identify with the location or the mise-en-scene of the play um, he also preferred using of masks for example in this play the good woman of Sesson, uh, the character, the main character, Shante, whenever she wants to be cruel or logical, she wears the mask of a man called Shuita. So, uh, so, th so the uh, play is uh, kind of reminding the audience that these are just characters and a woman can turn into a man by wearing a mask. And another important thing is that the play uh, follows the theme of Far Away long ago, especially that the German audience wouldn't identify with the characters who are living in China at, at a specific time in history. And this is useful in the sense, according to Bertolt Brecht, that by comparing the situation represented in this play or other plays, uh, the people can, um, can develop a critical mind. And let us move to the next mode of uh, dramatization, Antonin Artaud's uh, theory of the theater of cruelty is represented in his The First Manifesto of the Theater of Cruelty and the Second Manifesto. Uh, in the theater of cruelty, um, uh, actually Artaud theorizes the idea that both the audience and the actor should suffer or should uh, should uh, experience some pain uh, during the uh, the performance. So there are many discordant things over the stage. Like we have sounds. Uh, there are different sounds, and among those sounds, you have to listen to what the actor is saying. And it is not an easy task uh, because he also urges the actor to sometimes, uh, for example. Uh, shout and sometimes whisper so you can and not easily follow uh what is being uh told by the by the actor over the stage 
or um, physical gestures. He he was very strict on that. He um, he specifies uh, the locations uh, or the direction through which the ca the actors are supposed to move over the stage. Or he also believed that the audience should be seated on the center. And so he thought that the uh, barn, for example, or the church are good places for performance because the center is where the audience is sitting and there is no auditorium and then the the play should be performed around them and they are supposed to move they are supposed to change the direction of their heads so that they can see what is up in each corner of the place and he also uh, uh, believed in the strange scenery so sometimes uh, the, the dressing and also the mise-en-scene um, was not following the uh, the realities which we expect to appear on the stage for example he thought that the light uh, should bother the eyes of the audience he wanted to psychologically involve the audience in a different way maybe contrary to what was the idea of Bertolt Brecht um, he wants some su such an emotional involvement in which the audience would feel pain what you see here is um, a, a scene from the performance of his play the Chenji uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley the English play and a play a, a poet and playwright had written a play called The Chenji, but uh, Arthur wanted to rewrite that play. He thought that Chenji's play, um, in, as he's, he has written in the manifesto, is full of, um, uh, its language is full of meteors. He means that uh, Shelley has focused on language, but he wants to focus on the performance. So he rewrote the, the Chenji in a way that the performance uh, would be elaborate and significant and more highlighted. Here we see the character of Beatrice. Uh, the character is played by a Ukrainian and actress whose husband was French and she didn't spoken she didn't sp uh, speak French in a fluent way uh, but um, and and the audience the French audience were actually bothered they were annoyed they couldn't understand her French but this was intentional on the side of Arto and in this scene he's also the, the, we see a scene from the torture Be Beatrice's torture in the prison and uh, the 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 actor not only the character but also the actor actress here as being tortured because uh, this actress had short hair and uh, and this uh, this kind of veil um, uh, is supposed to be attached to her hair so her neck as you can uh, just see uh, barely in the photo um, uh, 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 was uh, feeling some pain or tension in it um, and he thought that maybe we, we should put different items, mannequins over the stage. We should pronounce words which which um, uh, defies the real pronunciation of the words. He thought that we have to revive incantation and ritual and dance, for example, movements and gestures over the stage. If you're interested, you can check out his two manifestos on the theater of cruelty. I, I tried to provide a summary of them. Um, Another dramatic figure was the Romanian-born Eugene Unesco. He wrote many of his plays in French, and he is one of the proponents of the, the theater of the absurd. Um, uh, um, by the theater of the absurd, we mean a kind of play in which the rules of plot and characterization are not that much followed it. And the aim of the play is to show the absurdity of life. Um, the, his plays focus on the uh, hopeless efforts to communicate communicate or the tragic vision of life devoid of meaning per, meaning or purpose his uh, dramas was influenced by Alfred Jarry um, and uh, what was um, actually called pataphysics or pataphysics by this they meant that uh, they, they, they refer to something which is beyond the metaphysics some something which which does not exist but you feel it, uh, or it is in there. Uh, and he, they wanted to show, like like the belly you don't have, but you feel fat. Um, okay, uh, so um, in his play, the rhinoceros, which is um, which is 
about a, a character called Branje, um, who among uh, other characters who little, who one by one and little by little turn into uh, rhinos uh, rhinoceros, who remains a human being. Um, in this play uh, and many other plays written by UNESCO, he tries to show the distance between the bourgeoisie and a person who doesn't want to be part of that community. So the uh, rhinoceros actually uh, represents what is the bourgeois community and branches uh, standing aloof from that type of society. And when Eugene Unesco uh, was asked in one of his interviews what, uh, what why he had chosen uh, this animal, he said that if I had chosen a sheep or even a uh, tessa tessa fly, um, the, the audience would not be surprised, but a rhinoceros would surprise them. So I chose this animal. Um, another major dramatist uh, is Samuel Beckett. Samuel Be Beckett was Irish, but he migrated to Europe and he lived a great portion of his life around Europe, especially Fran France and Switzerland. Uh, Samuel Beckett um, has famously written Waiting for Godot. Uh, Waiting for Godot is one of the most important representations of the of the theater of, uh, of Absurd because the two characters, Dragon and Vladimir, are waiting for, for a being, maybe God uh, or Godot, which is not supposed to come and uh, the, every day uh, is like the previous day and nothing nobody nobody comes nobody goes nothing happened in this play according to uh, Samuel Beckett himself uh, so so um, in waiting for Godo he shows the absurdity of life and uh, the lack of any change and and there there is a character in the play Lucky uh, who, who also um, um, speak uh, in his speech or his um lines uh talks about nonsensical things he uses some words but structurally speaking grammatically speaking what he says doesn't make sense so um both in his uh linguistic aspect and in the representational aspect samuel beckett in this play uh, tries to show the irrationality and the absurdity of life in this universe he is, has also famously written the play Not I. Uh, in, in this radical play, uh, the, the, there are no characters and uh, the only speaking subject on the stage are a pair of lips and um, whose voice uh, should have been the voice of a woman based on the directions of the play. And you can see how this play uh, or how the director struggled to, to present these. And if you're interested, uh, you can check um, on YouTube. I, I suppose you can find it. Uh, the, the 1973 production of the play under the directions of Samuel Beckett himself. And there is a movie based on that. Another dramatic mode related to the theater of the absurd is the, the uh, comedies of menace by harold pinter by the comedies of menace we mean um, uh, a kind of comedy in which people are um, are exposed to or are doing directly um, actually engaged in doing harsh and cruel things but um, at the same time uh, they can experience um, a sense of comicness or a com um, uh, or, or some comic experiences uh, this can be uh, best represented in his play, The Dumb Waiter. In The Dumb Waiter, two actually murderers, two professional murderers, are in a hotel room or somewhere like that, and they are waiting for the command so that their boss would tell, tell them who they are supposed to kill next. And um, uh, the, the dumb waiter is just the moving elevator between the rooms uh, supposed to um, deliver food. Uh, but here they, they are waiting for the dumb waiter so that they, they, um, and they would or the boss would tell them um, who is the next um, uh, their next hunt. Um, anyway, the, uh, the next one who's supposed to be murdered is one of them. So while they are joking, while they are talking, spending time, uh, they, they, they are actually spending time to kill. 
um, another human being. And this time, the comedy of menace um, in its best form is represented as one of these characters is actually supposed to be murdered. And finally, uh, we come across uh, the great figure, Tom Stoppard. Uh, Tom Stoppard um, is also um, indebted to the theater of Beckett and um, his, uh, his dues and his um, workplace are, are somehow influenced by Samuel Beck, especially Waiting for Godot. Uh, in his Rosencrantz and Guildenstern art that he writes a parody of Hamlet's, uh, William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, but this time we see Hamlet from the eyes of two minor characters, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. So the play is a deconstructive one. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Hamlet's friends and they are supposed to uh, take Hamlet to England so that the King of England can execute him. But in midway, uh, Hamlet changes uh, the letter. He imitates the handwriting of his uncle Claudius and he changes the letter and he commands the King of England to kill Rosencrantz and Guildenstern when they reached England. So Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead um, is a play in which we already know the ending and the title also tells the ending ending, but we see everything in uh, in Hamlet this time from the angle point of these two characters. And uh, some rules of physics, for example, are uh, treated in the play. Um, some rules of uh, dynamics, for example, in the movements of the objects um, and, some things, uh, so, uh, and, and um, some things like that from the uh, field of science. But also uh, Tom Stoppard uh, shows a play within a play within a play because Hamlet itself has a play within a play. Um, and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern encounter um, a group of actors and a director, and then they also joined them. So uh, they, they didn't want to, but they are now part of the action. So they are they are themselves acting out in a theater, which is uh, uh, the smaller part of the big scenery of uh, the play Hamlet. Uh, if you're interested, you can watch this movie, which is also directed by Tom Stoppard himself. Tom Stoppard is always engaged with the issue of time. And if uh, you, you like to see how he thinks that the past and the present are merged into one another. And if you want to see a, an example of a postmodernist drama, you can check out his Arcadia. Uh, so this was my um, introduction to the drama of the Toronto Century. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope I can see you in my next videos.